Hello everyone, I'm Sky Firth, I'm Senior Conservator of Fashion and Textiles here at the NGV and I'm joined today by my colleague Charlotte Bodicast, so who is NGV's Curatorial Assistant of Fashion and Textiles. So welcome to this new virtual program series we're running, Fashion Fridays, uh, where we look at fashion at the NGV, um, upcoming exhibitions with NGV curators, conservators and some special guests. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional owners of the land in which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here with us today. As we are joining you today remotely, I'd also like to acknowledge we um, that we uh, that people present in today's talk may be on the lands of other traditional custodians and we pay respects to their communities um, at wherever they are as well. Great, so hello everyone. Um, to begin our lecture today, I'm just briefly going to explain the relationship between curatorial and conservation. Curators acquire works for the collection and produce exhibitions and conservation treat the works. Our departments work very closely all the time, but especially on exhibitions to ensure that a work is displayed to its very best advantage. Before a work is displayed or photographed for the online collection, there's a lot of research and preparation involved, which we're just going to dive a little deeper into now. Yeah, so because um, Charlotte and I were talking about this and because we're so limited, obviously, today, we've only got 20, min 20 minutes with you guys um, and it's such a big topic that we're talking about today. We could talk for hours and hours. So uh, what we've decided is to just briefly touch on the conservation work that goes on, on behind the scenes. So it's my team and I that organise all of the conservation work. So whether it be a new work that's coming into the collection or a collection that is being put onto an exhibition schedule, everything actually runs through our lab and I'm actually sitting in the lab today. Um, and it could be any number of treatments that actually um, are undertaken on these on on the garments before you actually see them when you actually come in, and that could be anything from a very quick five minute um, uh, restitch of a scene that's come undone, or it could be a very very involved condition um, condition treatment and huge uh, conservation work that might be months or years for actually uh, for us to actually undertake it. So as Charlotte said, we work really, really closely with our curatorial team, which is really wonderful. And what we're able to do most of the time is actually schedule a lot of those treatments that are going on either months or in some cases years in advance. So we know that when we do need something on display and show you the public, we know that we can actually get that conservation work done. So, but that's a, a very, very large topic that we don't possibly have time today to actually <laughs> cover completely. Um, but it is a really important part of the work and actually everything that you see when you come into the gallery in terms of fashion and textiles, there will have been some sort of conservation work that's actually gone into in order for it to actually safely be put onto display. Yeah, thanks, Sky. Yeah, so I guess, you know, something that's really important is ensuring that the appropriate mannequin is chosen for display. Fortunately, we have a really vast selection of historical and contemporary and dressmaker forms to sort of choose from. Um, we do. Yeah, yeah, it's great. So, Sky, do you want to sort of talk to the differences between the kinds of mannequins? Yeah, so we have um, a number of different mannequins and I'm just trying to get it to go to the next slide and it's saying it's not going to want to do that. Ah, oh, there we go. There cool. we go. So here, at, broadly speaking, we've got mannequins that fall into three different categories. So we have our wonderful historical mannequins and they're very specialised mannequins. They come from the Kyoto Fashion Institute and we call them our KCI mannequins. They, broadly speaking, they come in 18th century, 20th century and 19th century mannequins in a number of different sizes. And the reason that we like those is because they're so specialised for these amazing historic works that we have. Because 
most of the historic works that we have in the collection are actually very small works. So while we may need to do a lot of build up on them compared to contemporary works that we have or fashion and textiles that we may see now, they're actually really teeny tiny. And actually this tiny girl next to me here is actually one of our KCI mannequins. So you can actually see how small she is compared to the other work, the other mannequins that we have. And because they're so specialised, we really love them because we can get some of those very, very teeny tiny historical works onto these specialised mannequins. So then we also have our contemporary mannequins and they're often um, probably what a lot of people are used to seeing in department stores or dress stores. They are uh, obviously quite tall. Most of them are over about six foot. They're um, quite large mannequins. But for a lot of our contemporary works, they're perfect because um, we can adapt them as we need to for the works that are actually going on to display. And then uh, the last type of category of mannequins that we have are our dressmaker mannequins. So they're a very timeless silhouette. Often they don't have arms on them. Um, and for people out there today who might be a little bit familiar with mannequins, they're often the mannequins that you either see on um, uh, in fashion uh fashion archives and also they might be the sort of mannequins that you yourself might actually build or work on um, if you are so inclined to do some dressmaking at home. So it's a very stylized, very classical silhouette, 1950s works looks great, look great on them and also they're a really good mannequin to um, very quickly put almost any work on and get a really good idea of the fit and the, the drape of um, the work once it's on display. And I guess also, you know, majority for, well, I guess a lack of a better term, mannequins typically are sample size. Sort of, you know, why is that too? So yeah. So look, it's a re it's a really good question, and it's really important for us too, because obviously it would be great for us to have a range of mannequins that was a, a whole bunch of different size, but in sizes. But in reality, that's not actually very practical for us because a lot of the fashion that we have in our collection. Uh, but yes, there are certainly sample sizes of things. So certainly a lot of stuff that we get that comes straight off runways. It's very, very teeny tiny and it works very perfectly on our sample size mannequins. But also too, a lot of the other pieces that we have in our collection, they aren't often built to size. So they're actually bespoke pieces that were built for the person who bought it to wear. So for us to have a whole bunch of different size mannequins isn't very useful because what we really need to do is really, we need to actually build the padding underneath the mannequin in order to properly support the work when it's on display. And so that might be anything from from a bigger set of boobs to some more bum to, you know, a whole petticoat and um, panniers and beautiful corsets that our underpinning specialist makes for us. So we really actually do need to work with a mannequin that's much smaller than we need in reality when you guys see it on display because we need to safely build those layers up so the work when it is on display can be safely displayed for the for the time that it's up because we don't want to you know be coming up there a couple of days later and go oh no there's some seam splits because the mannequin is too big so actually mm -hmm. having very very small mannequins that we have to build up is the exact sort of situation that we want to be in yeah it's really not as easy as just looking it's up. not it's very <laughs> time consuming and look I and mean, that's a good point so for all of those underpinnings that we do do, um, you know, some of them might take us a day to prepare, but then a lot of the more elaborate pieces that we do, especially for our historical ones, we might it might take our underpinning specialist three months to actually prepare the proper underpinnings that go underneath the work. Mm. And we've got some good photos of those in a minute. Yeah, so should we just go through the examples that we've got for everyone? Let's do um, some examples. Yeah, so firstly, we've got this really lovely Kristen Dior 1955 Spring Summer Evening Dress, which some of you may remember from the 2017 House of Dior exhibition. Uh, this work really typifies Dior's sort of infamous hourglass silhouette that is popularly known as the new look. Um, Dior manipulated the female figure to accentuate feminine lines, as evident in this work here, with the really wide waist and full skirt that really make the waist the focal point. Um, 
And this was a big challenge. <laughs> it is. Like, this is, as I said, this is the perfect example of a teeny, teeny, tiny teeny, dress teeny. that marries with a teeny, teeny, tiny mannequin. And the mannequin is still not small enough. So by chance, I actually managed to get the mannequin out for you guys today. It's actually this mannequin in the middle here. So these are some of our um, very contemporary Confrad mannequins. They have a 55 centimetre waist, so it's already a teeny tiny waist. Our little Miss Dior has a 48 centimetre waist. So there's absolutely no way that we could get it onto the mannequin. So what we actually had to do a little bit brutally is we actually essentially have to cut the guts out of the mannequin. So we, fi we find those beautiful sides that we cut them out, put a little bit more foam, and then we, again, have to build the layers. So I've got a few photos to flick through for you to you guys f to have a look of the different layers. So this is the first layer that goes on. It's a hoop petticoat to get that beautiful uh, 1950s Dior look. Again, we've also put, and she's got it here today just behind me, just a very um, fine cotton layer over those edges that we have uh, cut out of the mannequin. So obviously we've made those edges quite smooth, but there's only so much smoothing of a fiberglass mannequin that you have. So you do like to have all of those um, extra layers just uh, to ensure that the work is safely on display. And then we go to the other petticoat layer just for a few more voluminous layers on our beautiful Dior. And then we have her once she's done. So it's a little bit brutal what we often have to do to our mannequins. And for those of you who are joining us today who did come and see our Christina Campbell Pretty Fashion Gift Show, um, we probably had about five or six mannequins in that show that we had to do that with, again, with our contemporary um, sample size mannequins. And the mannequins are just too big for the works that we got, we're putting them on. So it's a really interesting marriage of... Um, uh, getting the work safely on display and trying not to completely destroy the mannequin in the process. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. And now we've got, I think, our next example for you, which is more of a historical work. We so do. This is a really beautiful um, late 19th century dinner dress from the Parisian Couture House Felix. It was a family operated house and was one of the most pr prominent couturiers of the late 19th century and they were sort of known for dressing celebrities and socialites and things. Um, this dress was actually worn by Countess Craven who wore it as her wedding dress. Um, during the sort of the 1880s dresses were really characterised by bustles that created that sort of I guess like serpentine like silhouette and as we can see in these images Conservation had to create some very specialised underpinnings that supported the gun to sort of best re represent how it would have been worn in its time. Um, yeah, so just want to kind of give us a little chat about the bustle and everything that went into this one, Sky. Yeah, so this is one of our favourites. Um, it's it's so beautiful. The outside of the dress is so beautifully, beautifully embroidered, um, and it's at, it's um, got a very very nice feel to it. It's extremely heavy though, so it's actually a cotton um, and uh, cotton and silk velvet that's been beautifully embroidered. But because it's so heavy and because it's also so large, it was a really interesting process that Alan, our underpinning specialist, had to go through in order for get, to get it onto display. So this is, again, one of our KCI mannequins, so one of these little teeny tiny ones just next to me. Even though we actually were able to choose the biggest of the mannequins that we had for the right silhouette, she still needed quite a lot of work because, as you can see, she's quite buxom. She's got some um, some definite hips there as well. So Alan had to, that first image there of those underpinnings, that's um, a, a padded out uh, corset that Alan had to make to actually start the um, the basis for the underpinnings. And then obviously those, those extra layers, so there's the extra upper layer that was um, – also cut down you'll obviously see that that middle um uh that middle photo there is quite a high black neckline that was later cut down because obviously you see the image on uh on with the on with the work on the mannequin you can obviously can't see the black there so it was cut down mm. um but then too then we've got um some extra hooping at the back to start that beautiful bustle and then lastly we've got an over 
uh, over petticoat, just accentuating that bustle again, and a little teeny tiny bum pad that you could, some of you will just be able to see, which is calico that sits right at the top. And that's to accentuate that, um, that beautiful bustle at the back and to have the bustle actually sit nice and flat and correctly on display. And so it's all those different layers that have to go um, uh, to have to go underneath, not just to actually get the uh, the right silhouette, which is obviously important for us and for you um, as the public to see on display, but also um, uh, the actual um, uh, the the work being supported on display and being able to be on display for the periods where you see it into the uh, in the actual exhibition. Yeah, and it's. Pretty rare, I guess, to um, even have any surviving underpinnings. So it's a real, real task for your team, Sky, to create all of these pieces. But yeah, yeah. So we are actually pretty lucky. Uh, we do have some uh, pieces in the collection that are real historical under, underpinning pieces. They're really, really rare in the world, um, mm. and that's mostly because. Um, it, for people back then, they would have had potentially one or two dresses that they they had, but they would have ordinarily really only had one set of underpinnings. So underpinnings are hugely rare and they're very, very valued. Um, there are um, collections that specialise just in underpinnings. So for us to actually have one, we have these two um, uh, underpinnings that you see in these images and we also have a number of very specialised corsets which are very, very prized and we pour over them and as an Alan, our underpinning specialist, she also studies them quite closely to make sure that what she is producing um, for the works when you see them on display are as close as possible to what would have been underneath um, originally, and that's that's part of the um, the specialist nature of getting the silhouettes right on display for when you see fashion here. Yeah, for sure. Mm. And then we, I guess we can move into the sort of fun thing that we get to do, is, which is you know, really making sure that um, like the styling of mannequins is like appropriate and contextual. And, you know, in some instances, we've been really lucky to acquire full looks that include accessories and shoes and hats. And we've got a couple examples here. So this 1986 um, body map ensemble and then this, I think, 2009 world outfit as well. Um, in cases where we don't have full looks and things and a work does need, you know, something else to complete its presentation, we've been really lucky to work with local and international milliners Richard Nyland and Stephen Jones who have produced custom headpieces for recent NGV exhibitions. So this little, this photo in the sort of to your right sort of centre here, that's a Richard Nyland piece that he created for the Christina Campbell Pretty gift. Um, and then... On the right here, we have an example from Collecting Com in 2019, where which was a really exciting project where we got to sort of collaboratively design these headpieces to complement the different seasons and things of the works. And um, also with Com as well, we had to sort of source some like nondescript sort of footwear and things that complement the look, but also don't confuse the viewer that they're actually part of the artwork. Um, can you did I kind of tell us a little bit about how you developed these headpieces, Sky? Yeah, yeah. Look, and, and I'll talk about our collecting comp first because I mean that that's the most recent, and I uh, certainly for my team and I that was really quite exciting because we usually don't get to do those sort of collaborations on headdresses. Usually, as Charlotte says, it's something that we have a. Um, you know, a, a local or an international milliner who comes in and actually creates headpieces for us, or indeed we have the pieces that are with the looks themselves. So for us, it was quite exciting to to get our um, our hands in there, so to speak, to actually create a lot of these um, these head important headpieces that went with the collecting com exhibition. Um, and it was a little bit different for us, a really creative process. Obviously, working with our curatorial team, um, our design team as well, and also looking at a lot of the contemporary images for the works they're actually putting on display. 
Um, and so it was a little bit of a challenge for us to get all of those things together. But, we, you know, we like a bit of a challenge, so that's good. <laughs> um, and then it, looking, and again, as Charlotte said, in terms of pieces that we do have in the collection, that are, is, a, is a full outfit. That is not only the clothing, but the hat and the shoes as well. They're really important for us as well, not only because they get, you know, you as the viewer get to see the, the entire piece. But it's the in, this interesting marriage um, for us of actually putting them safely on display onto the right sort of mannequin. And it's one of those um, really careful um, constructed um, decisions that we need to make because obviously uh, ha getting hats on is one thing and we have some really sneaky ways of doing little tabs here and there and, and hiding things on to, to have the, um, the real life hat actually securely on a mannequin um, but often we don't have that luxury with shoes so a lot of the contemporary mannequins that we have uh, are they're, they're actually physically um, put onto the plinth that you guys see them on with a foot pole so that is something that goes straight through the bottom of the fit so foot. so obviously we can't do that with collection shoes um, so we do have some sneaky ways around and we have some alternative mannequins that we can use that have other sort of um, uh, fitting so we can show you the original shoes but often uh, for us we actually do some uh, uh, shoes that we have specifically for the process of display. So they're not collection shoes mm -hmm. um, and we have a vast array of historical periods that those shoes come from. Brutally speaking and back to the, you know, the mannequin destruction that I was talking about before, a lot of those shoes actually do need to be drilled through the bottom. So we actually um, uh, can actually have the mannequin and um, the shoes on display at once. So, but as I said, they're definitely, definitely not um, collection shoes. They're definitely adjunct shoes that we have specifically for the purpose of display. And a lot of the shoes that we um, uh, were uh, lucky enough to display in the Christina Campbell, uh, Campbell Pretty Fashion Gift were display shoes like that. So we're very lucky. We have a huge array um uh, that we're able to join on but yeah the the accessorizing thing is really fun for us because it's um a little bit out of the normal for me and my team so we yeah. do enjoy it when we can do it yeah for sure yeah and I think do we have some other kid pieces as well that we've worked on we did, yeah so we just have some more and these are some um ones that were purpose made Charlotte yeah great these are from our 200 years of fashion show um, and they, uh, they're they now in the collection as adjunct pieces. So for a lot of the pieces um, uh, that you may have seen in that show that you might see in the future, those headdresses may well be back on the mannequins again. And they're, they're just so beautifully prepared and beautifully yes. made. And we do, um, you know, really love when we can uh, show you guys a, a purpose um uh, you know, a purpose-made display with not only shoes and hats, but the beautiful works as well. And it all marries everything together in terms of, the, you know, fashion and textiles on display. Yeah, and it's nice that we're able to sort of archive those pieces as well and sort of and reuse them and, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's maybe all we've got time for today, isn't it? I think it might be, Yeah. It feels very quick, but I was, you know, it's yeah, so, so brief, for everyone. And lovely to chat to you, Charlotte, today as well. Thank you too, Sky. So I just want to get, get, thank everyone for joining and we hope you enjoyed today's program. It's been a real pleasure for us to introduce you to these works in the NGV collection. And we look forward to seeing you back finally in the gallery when we reopen and I hope you can also join us for next week's Fashion Fridays program where we look at recent acquisitions of British designers. So thanks again, everyone. Lovely to see you all. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Guy. Bye, everyone.